Oh, glad to see everybody out there. Glad to be here tonight. I'd like to start out with just saying a home, a hatake ase. And in my language, that's basically for this purpose, saying hello to all my relations, all my family there. We're all one. Um, I'd like you to remember that. There'll be a quiz on it at the end of this. So, talking about conflict and moving forward from conflict. Wow, boy, those are bright. How to move forward from conflict and what is conflict? I guess the first thing I'd like to do is give a little bit of a definition to go with that. Conflict and chaos tend to go hand in hand. Um, conflict, two opposing forces come together. They don't want to cooperate. They don't want to work together. They've got two different goals. Chaos, on the other hand, is when you have one force coming in, it hits a peak point of chaos, and it tends to go like this in conflict, trying to get through that chaos. Kind of like a plane breaking through the sound barrier, wants to get through the chaos. When that first happened, the first few tries on that, the plane exploded in the air and flew apart, and they couldn't break the sound barrier. Finally, when the X1, the last guy that flew that, he came up and he hit that peak point of chaos, and he radioed back to him, and he says, hey, this thing's, I can't handle it. It feels like it's going to fly apart, and everybody on the ground's like, oh my God, we're going to lose another pilot. All of a sudden, he just gave it full throttle. They heard a big boom. Everybody sh held their head down. What happened on the other side, once he broke through the conflict of that moment and the chaos of that moment, was he moved to a higher, more efficient level of functioning. One that set the standard for how we travel and get around today. He just had to push through that chaos, through that bit of conflict right there. Now, in preparing for this whole thing, I had a few people say, Roy, share some of your experiences on this and on the conflict and the chaos and how you dealt with that and what happened. So I'd like to share a few stories with you. And start out with one quick solution. I don't have any visuals with this because I really couldn't think of anybody. So I want to have you just all close your eyes for a minute and we're going to deal with a little situation of conflict on one way to deal with it. So just close your eyes for a moment and imagine that you've been in conflict with an individual, but instead of being there button heads with them, you're sitting in a mountain meadow and it's a nice grassy mountain meadow and there's butterflies and you can hear the birds. They're chirping. The wind is gently blowing. You're there next to a nice stream. It's an icy cold stream. You can hear the water babbling. The person you're in conflict is there with you and you're holding their head under the water. <laughs> that's one way you could do it. <laughs> Probably not the best way in the world to do it, but that's one way you could do it. And so what I want to share is a few things that I've seen throughout my life and experienced and things that other people shared with me. Now, one of them, we heard some talk earlier about restorative justice. I've heard that term go around at the TED Talks here. And with restorative justice, there's this great little exercise that I seen one time. This lady showed to me. Had a big old bag of sticks and a group of people and they sit around a circle and they can't talk. They have to build a sculpture with this bag of sticks. And you take something out of it, put something in it, move it however you want and you turn to the left and you nod your head. And it goes around until everybody comes into consensus and agreement that it is the way it should be by everybody nodding their head without making a sound. The person that trained me this was training in Minneapolis on this. And she was there with a group of social workers, a few lawyers, prosecuting attorney, a couple of judges, a police officer. Two and a half hours into this, they could not come to a consensus. Police officer gets up, picks up the bag, throws all the sticks and stones and all the other stuff in the bag and walks out the door. And they go, OK, I guess we're over. That's done. And they start processing what happened there. About an hour later, he shows back up and asks him to get back into the circle. And this is something that really, for me, opened my eyes to how important consensus is to our community, to our people. He sits down in the circle and he lays out two Polaroid photographs. This is a while back. And he lays them out and one of them was from a tombstone from a young man who had been shot there in town and everybody knew about it in Minneapolis. It was a real high profile case. And the other one was of a young man sitting in a jail cell. And these are both kids that were, you know, minors. And he laid them both down on top of the bag and he just looked at him and he says, I've had it. This is what happens when you people can't come into consensus. That really got me. That woke me right up and said, what is going on here? Now I was at that point in time in a small community down in Wyoming. Now, I love Wyoming. It's my home state. I don't know if I can really call it a state. It's a small town with really long streets. 
I'm related to her. I know somebody in every single town in the state, and so does everybody else. By the same token, if you look at it from a business structure, it's very, very closed. And it's all about, for lack of a better term, that good old boy network. It's who knows who knows who, and that's how you get things done. That's how you survive. It's been that way forever there, because it is a small community. You rely on your neighbor. You have to rely on your neighbor. So I'm sitting there, this is right after 9-11, and I'm looking around a community, and this is one question that whenever you get into conflict or consensus, that I always encourage people to ask, what is trying to happen here? What's really trying to happen? And I looked at the community, and I said, what is trying to happen here? And I looked around, and what was trying to happen is we had a community that had a 53% poverty rate, 17% middle income, and the next income bracket above that started at 250000 and went up. Okay. The middle income in that community was basically fed by the social service system. That's where the people were that were in middle income. It was the teachers, it was the attorneys, it was the police officers, it was all the therapists, it was the complete social service system. Really was the middle income of the community, with their hands tied, unable to help and frustrated, very, very frustrated. So somebody says, Roy, why don't you and the people you know start a mental health center? Like, okay, sure, I can do that, why not? And they're like, well, okay, get together with these guys over here and we want you to create a board over there and they're gonna be your board of directors and they're gonna tell you how to do this and you're gonna go get these grants up here and there's this really great program over here and as long as you use that program, these people will fit the program and you'll get funded for that program and you can go out there and put the services out in the community and you're gonna make a whole bunch of money. And I went, wait a minute. That's the same program that they used over here and there and there. What do I do about the people that don't fit the program? How do I meet their need? Now couple this with a Medicaid program and a community mental health system that's funded by the state that says one community mental health system per community. That's it. No more. See where the conflict is in this of what the community needs, what the people need, what they want, and what the system was able to provide based on the rules that it had. So with that, I did something totally unfounded. I created a community mental health center that was a private for-profit corporation with the goal of rebuilding a community one family at a time and doing that from the ground up. For five years, we did not have an office. For five years, all my therapists, all my case managers, all my peer specialists, skill trainers worked in the home with the families. Set up on a model 45 hours a week for the first week, 30 hours a week for the next two weeks, 15 hours a week after that. Then we tapered off with an aftercare program that they designed. This was very successful. Enter the next part of the conflict. What do we do about it? How do we address it? The state would not fund it, and Medicaid didn't want to pay for it. So how do you get around that? Here's one more conflict. And the point I'll get to this is there, there is a simple way to look at all of this. You've got a funding stream here that provides everything for the entire state set up on a set of rules that they believe are the truth and they're the only rules that they can work within. I went a level above that to the Centers for Medicaid Services and I looked at their guidelines and rules and found out that there is a provision that was approved by the state for a program called Targeted Case Management. Loophole, I love loopholes. Loopholes are great. We got certified by Medicaid as a targeted case management program, but to provide targeted case management, you had to have a therapeutic treatment plan, so we had to hire a therapist. It opened up all the billing codes and boom, I had a community mental health center. Totally private, for profit funded primarily by Medicaid, that could go do a brand new system that was totally designed and tailored to the community. Okay. The idea behind this in the, in the conflict and why I wanted to share this story and how to get through this and what this really means is that you don't necessarily have to go out and fight any given system. Why would you fight your own family? Why would you fight the people that you're sitting next to, that are sitting behind you or in front of you, that live next door to you? They're trying to do the same thing, trying to live. So rather than try and fight that system, even though there are pieces of the system that didn't want us to do what we were doing because it didn't fit in the model, 
I gave no power to the conflict. As much as I wanted to hold her heads under water and sit on that mountain meadow and be happy doing it, I would not acknowledge their existence. It's kind of a Taoist perspective on it. There's a parable that I really like. Buddhists and the Taoists are standing on a bridge. And you can think of the Buddhist in this picture as being the system and the rules and the guidelines for that. And the Taoist is, well, he's Taoist. And a young passerby comes by on the bridge and asks them both, looks over the edge of the bridge and says, why did the fish swim that way? Always pointing that direction. The Buddha says, because that is the way and it will always be the way they do it. The Taoist says, because that's what they're doing right now. Pretty straightforward. This is, that's what they're doing right now. So overcoming this conflict and moving to consensus, the conflict is there. What purpose does it serve? Why does it serve it? And what's trying to happen were the questions that we asked every single day until we got a family to ask those, until we got a school to ask those, until we got a community to ask those. Once we got the school, the community, the families to ask those, lo and behold, one day, the state of Wyoming called up and said, we're reauthoring the rules for mental health in Wyoming. What's trying to happen here? Now there are no rules. They're gone. The only rule is get accreditation. Be nationally accredited and certified. And you can go out and help the people. Now this is a great amount of conflict that many people in Wyoming had tried to change by legal means, getting attorneys. They tried pushing it. They tried battling the system. They tried everything they could to take this thing head on and hit it as hard as they could. And what it really took was someone to just say, let that go over here. And let's come to a consensus on what's trying to happen. Coming to that consensus on what's trying to happen, we built our sculpture. And we built our sculpture in a community. And that sculpture from that community spread out. It spread out the peer specialists that are now able to provide services there. It spread out the targeted case managers that can now operate without a therapeutic treatment plan. They can go out and do targeted case management and help the individuals find the therapist, find the other programs, find the treatment, work with law enforcement, work with probation, work with all those services independently and provide the services. The beauty of all of this that I come back to with it is an African term. If we've got some computer techno geeks out there, they'll think it means something else. But it's called Ubuntu. Ubuntu means I am what we all are. We all are what I am. And that's community. So the in looking at all this, honoring the conflict, it's there. I kind of enjoy looking at it now, and I think we should all enjoy looking at the conflict. There's a certain amount of strength and comfort in seeing it and knowing that we don't have to be a part of it, that we can take that conflict and see what's trying to happen, and we can come into an agreement and a consensus on what's trying to happen and what are we going to do about it, and how can we help it happen. That's all we got to do is help it happen. That's really about it for all I've got today. I'm a little bit shorter than the rest of them. And I just wanted to share that. I was asked to share that with everybody. So I'd like to share it. And if there's any questions, yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's an expansive question. Um, the next year I'm spending in the planning phases of, oh, it's being termed Center for Excellence right now for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. 
and taking a lot of these ideas and a lot of modern technology and providing an educational program for the Bureau of Indian Affairs so that they can educate judges, lawyers, child protective workers, social workers, school officials, everybody that deals with kids on the Indian Child Welfare Act, reporting requirements, how to manage that, as well as their meth initiatives and how to work with the meth programs and reservations. Year two will be the beginning stages of implementation. Year three, it's going to be fully, fully implemented and going. It's basically going to be a university for the BIA.